that guy's just me. Yep, that's me. You're probably wondering how I ended up in this situation. Help me, Jesus! Help me, Jewish God! Help me, Allah! Ah! Well, all right. This is uh, Ozzy Grimm with the Gamers Grimm. And uh, as you could tell from the title, it's going to be my review of Amazon's Fallout TV series. Um, I am probably one of the longest playing veterans of this game. Fallout 1 was the very first RPG I ever played on PC. And I have played every game on every platform and every DLC in chronological order for the last 26 years. It is my favorite game series. It is my favorite RPG. And uh, I can be honest and say that I had no... uh, I didn't believe for a second that it would ever become a television show. I figured that it was too dystopian and dark mixed with slapstick and campy and cheese that uh, I, I was highly doubtful that there was any producers or writers or actors who would be able to ever do the Fallout universe some justice. So I'll start with that. I'm going to light up my cigar and then I'm going to talk about my feelings about the show. There we go. So as I said, I am a huge fan of Fallout. Um, 26 years, as long as the game series has been out. Um, And I'll say this, pretty damn good. Pretty goddamn good. I'll admit, I was skeptical. I was ready to dislike the show, um, especially with the way how Hollywood and uh, a lot of uh, production companies have treated IPs in the last decade. Uh, I felt that it was, it was going to be a complete and utter disaster. Um, but I was wrong. It was, it's pretty good. As far as video game adaptations go, it was pretty damn good. While I can imagine that a great deal of the uh, accolades go to the writers, I'm going to go ahead and say that the real heroes of making this show work were the characters and the actors who played them. Uh, Ella Purnell absolutely adored her as Lucy. She played the perfect uh, vault dweller. The, she towed a line between, between being naive but ambitious, but also being you know, capable, but also real ignorant and... Uh, really kind of relying on other people. I was really worried she was going to become a Mary Sue, but no, she earned uh, the things that she earned and worked for them, and there was a reason why she worked, uh, you know, was able to do things, and that's a, that's a really good trait for a vault dweller. Uh, Aaron Moten, who plays Maximus, absolutely loved him. He is, he is, a, he is definitely an idiot savant build, you know, lots of luck, very little charisma, but he's willing to go out and uh, make things happen and uh, did a wonderful job of portraying him as sort of a, uh, what I would think of as a brotherhood initiate. Uh, They call them squires in the show. Uh, There are people who are complaining that that's a a bit of a retcon. I'm going to say, after playing every single one of the games, that's not a retcon. That is just a change in continuity. I feel like the West Coast Brotherhood would eventually devolve into a pseudo-religious cult uh, since it's been separated from the other two chapters uh, of the Brotherhood of Steel. So that kind of makes sense to me. They were already on their way to becoming a a religious cult that revolves around sort of technophile and technologies type, type stuff. So... That's not really a retcon for those people who are saying that it is. Uh, For the people who are new to the Fallout series, uh, there are three major chapters of the Brotherhood of Steel. There's the West Coast chapter, which is what we get to see in the show. There's the Midwest chapter, 
which for all intensive purposes we believe has been wiped out, but there is no confirmation that the Midwest chapters were wiped out. Only that uh, stuff that you've read on uh, terminals and uh, through radio broadcasts. And then there's an East Coast uh, version of the Brotherhood of Steel, which, in my opinion, is probably going to evolve, evolve into a more altruistic, more governing form of, uh, of, of the Brotherhood, like what people probably wanted the West Coast version in the show to be like. Uh, but not to spoil too much, there's a little bit of a spoiler here. Uh, for non-game uh, players who might be going in and playing the games, uh, Elder Lions sort of broke away from the way that the Brotherhood of Steel on the West Coast operated. They fought a civil war. It's a whole thing. But essentially, the Brotherhood of Steel is divided into three particular groups, with the Midwest chapter actually being probably the most open and uh, the, most, uh, the one that recruits the most because their numbers were driven down so far that they were forced to start pulling from the wasteland. Uh, but we'll not go too far into that. Uh, and all the other characters were great, but let's be honest, we can't talk about this show without talking about Walton Goggins as the ghoul. What a phenomenal performance by him. Uh, I can honestly say that I didn't think I would love a ghoul character quite as much as I love Raul from the New Vegas game. Uh, Raul is probably my favorite companion uh, of all the companions, and it's very clear that Walton Goggins, uh, his ghoul, his Cooper, is is 100% based on Raul. He's a pre-war ghoul, lost his family. He's a gun-slinging cowboy in the case of of uh, Raul, he's a vaquero, and if you play out his story right, he wears a, a, a really amazing vaquero outfit, Mexican cowboy. Um, I think he's the best companion out of all the games because his passive is so damn useful, especially in New Vegas. Uh, but that's not to say that our boy uh, Hancock from the Fallout 4 uh, game is not an amazing ghoul companion either. I just happen to have a soft spot for my buddy Raul. Uh, but Walton Goggins Ghoul, he is 100% right up there with all the Ghoul characters that uh, Fallout tends to produce. And uh, he does it a fantastic uh, job of playing uh, the Ghoul. Johnny Pemberton as Thaddeus, he's a lot of fun. I like to see that, you know, I enjoyed seeing his character arc. arc. Even Michael Rappaport as Titus was, was pretty funny. And, and had his moments uh, for the time that he was in the show. Um, and that's not to say that Kyle McLaughlin, who plays the overseer, uh, Hank, uh, which is Ella Parnell's dad, and Michael Emerson, uh, he plays the, the Enclave guy. And then, of course, Maul Daver uh, does a great job of representing uh, kind of the, the fallen aspects of where the NCR might end up. So other than that, I can say that the show went really well. Um, yeah, there were a lot of things that I didn't like uh, on the surface, but they really are just minor complaints, in my opinion. Uh, one, of course, being that the Brotherhood of Steel uses the terrible, terrible assault rifle uh, from Fallout 4. I hate even seeing it on screen, um, but that's a minor gripe. I actually kind of understand why they would do that. Uh, it was a cost-saving measure. Uh, for all of you non-gamer now, Fallout fans now, the Brotherhood of Steel would have 100% been using laser rifles, Gatling lasers, as well as Tesla rifles and Tesla cannons. Um, but I would imagine that the special effects budget would have probably went through the roof trying to animate uh, all of the lasers and, and plasma weapons uh, on a mass scale like that. Uh, so it makes sense that they would uh, do the standard pew-pew, shoot them bang-bang with some pop caps. Uh, many people have complained, and I kind of have that same complaint, that I wanted to see other uh, types of power armor in the show uh, rather than the T-60. But I'll be honest, seeing the T-60 uh, as a practical effect was absolutely wonderful. I think it was great. 
Um, and it also serves a secondary purpose, too, I think, for the television show that we as the gamer fans need to sort of recognize is that if it is sta- it, the T-60 is now established as the power armor of the Brotherhood. And I think we'll get to see other versions of power armor in future seasons. Let's hope that we get them, uh, such as the XO series. And so the XO series could be uh, obviously the Enclave armor. And for a television show, that's a real good identifier. That's something that you can do to uh, help the audience sort of immediately identify factions on a maybe a large scale battle. And so now that the T-60 is sort of very closely associated with the Brotherhood of Steel in the, in the cinematic universe, we can see the XO uh, series sort of be the Enclave's uh, particular version of Power Armor. And that also gives us the opportunity to maybe see the NCR or other factions utilize like T-45 and Raider Armor so that that as the show progresses and people start to learn about the different factions, at least from a cinematic television and movie making perspective, you can instantly recognize, okay, these are who's on this side and who's on that side. Those are the Brotherhood. There's the Enclave. There's the NCR. I mean, it's easy for us in the game to, you know, differentiate those things because we spend so much time sort of interacting and ensconced in the world. But For the television show, it makes sense. Each faction would have kind of their own quote-unquote uniform. Uh, Some other people also complained that power armor was portrayed sort of weakly in some settings and uh, sort of strong in other settings and that that's not lore accurate, quote-unquote lore accurate. And yeah, you know, it isn't lore accurate, but it's kind of a fifth-layer 4D chess sort of cookie because it's game accurate. Like, let that sink in. It's video game accurate. Because in the video games, Power Armor, in some cases, is absolute hot garbage. And then other times, it's amazing. And a lot of it has to do with your build and your training and your understanding of how Power Armor works. And Power Armor can become good. But if you don't have any training and you don't know what you're doing, it it's trash. And... As crazy as it might seem, the show sort of represented a game-accurate representation of Power Armor, which I thought was kind of funny because I've heard people complaining about it. And I was like, well, it, that's about what it's like in the game. If Sometimes it just sucks and it doesn't do crap for you. You'd be better off walking around naked. It just looks like a, it's just a big, expensive showpiece that you get to stick in your, in your base. So... That doesn't really bother me. and and, and The ghoul character kicking the crap out of a bunch of people in Power power Armor makes perfect sense. Those guys are used to walking around in the wasteland bullying raiders and and picking on, you know, survivors. They've never faced off against a guy who's actually worn it, used it in a real-world combat situation. These guys that haven't spent nearly as much time in Power Armor as as, as Walton Goggins' characters has. So... That part I really enjoyed. Um, Another thing that I've seen a lot of people complaining about, which is really the crux of what I wanted to make this video about, was the nuking of Shady Sands. While I know that seems like it might be out of canon, I can assure you that from from the video games, that is quite lore accurate. That is canon. I think many of you uh, who played New Vegas... Uh, I'm going to go ahead and say that there's going to be spoilers ahead. So if you don't want any of the stories from the New Vegas game or its DLCs spoiled in any way, spoiler alert, uh, I'll put a a time to where you can skip the spoilers in, in the video. But it makes perfect sense that Shady Sands would be nuked. Fought just like right after the events of New Vegas. Because canonically, the last thing that the courier does before the Battle of Hoover Dam is walk the lonesome road as Courier 6. And I think a lot of people don't pay attention to the story a lot of times, but there are two subplots 
to the Lonesome Road DLC that most people have forgotten about. And one of the main subplots is that you, the courier, are delivering the launch codes for the Southwest's largest unexploded nuclear stockpile to the main character, the main protagonist, Ulysses. Now, there's a lot of different ways that you can end that DLC, but ultimately, Ulysses is a former member of the Legion. And we don't know exactly how much information uh, Ulysses gave to the Legion before he defected. I, in my personal opinion, would say the Legion 100% knows about. But if you follow another little sub-quest line, you also know that the NCR also sent a platoon into the Divide to find out what was going on, and they were all wiped out. So technically, the Legion has access to a massive nuclear stockpile and that the NCR does not yet know about. And so the last thing you do as the courier is deliver the launch codes to a massive stockpile of nuclear warheads to the Legion just before the Battle of Hoover Dam. And I know that they said that, that there's no necessarily a, a, a canon ending to New Vegas or to Fallout Boston as of yet as it pertains to the television show. But I'm going to guess, considering that the vast majority of the endings for New Vegas is the Legion loses the Battle of Hoover Dam, then it makes perfect sense that with Caesar's death and the loss of the Hoover Dam, the Legion would launch a nuclear strike against the NCR. And they have the weapons, the knowledge, and are in range to do so. So that's what happened to Shady Sands right after the, the events in New Vegas. Caesar dies, Hoover Dam is lost, they're going to launch the nuke. So it makes perfect sense that Shady Sands got nuked probably within hours, if not days, of the Battle of Hoover Dam. So we're not talking about a time frame of years between the ending of New Vegas and when Shady Sands is nuked. It could be minutes. That's how close we could be cutting it. So it makes perfect sense to me that, that uh, Shady Sands had been nuked. If you played the games and you played them canonically and played off the like secondary stories, it, it almost makes perfect sense. But I really enjoyed the show. I can't say much more about it other than go and watch it. If you're unfamiliar with the games, by all means, play the video games. Um, you will enjoy it. It'll make you feel even closer to the lore and the stories. Also, make sure you like, subscribe, and uh, comment down below. Talk about stuff. I don't do a lot of like new, you know, TV reviews or game reviews on my channel. I just sort of goof around and do shorts and build cool stuff in Valheim and, and uh, Starfield and things like that. But uh, I felt like this is my most favorite game. I love Fallout. I've played every single game in order. I just love them. And uh, it was nice to see a part of my childhood be taken care of and shown some respect. Uh, all the people who are longtime Fallout fans like me get to enjoy the show. And uh, all, I hope all the new Fallout television fans take the time to go out and play the video games. And uh, we just grow this community to a, to a massive scale. So once again, thanks everybody for stopping by. Uh, this has been Ozzy Graham with the Gamers Grimm.